Hello out there all my bookish friends in booktube land and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics and a special welcome to you 5,300 subscribers, you wonderful people you. In this episode, what we're going to be looking at is 12 classic books that are great fun to read, easy to read and a great way to get into classic literature. And I specifically mentioned 12 because maybe coming up to the new year you have the plan of reading more classics and want to get ones that you'll really enjoy. So without further ado, let's get stuck in, shall we? Now I just want to give you a bit of background information on where this video comes from. Uh, it's a subscriber called Jay got in touch with me through an email and he was saying how he wants to get into classic literature but he's not a particularly avid reader. Uh, he said he's a slow reader. Nothing wrong with pace of reading by the way. Go at your own pace. You don't have to be fast. Um, but he just wanted to know what would be 12 books which would be enjoyable and I thought that's a really good video to make because maybe you or maybe you've got friends that you want to get into reading in the new year, they may set the target of reading maybe a book a month. And so I wanted to think of, through books that I've read, what are novels that show the classics, not to be stodgy, but to be thoroughly enjoyable. And that's where I came up with this video. But, and here's the interesting thing, I obviously went away and did extra research on other people's lists just to see that I hadn't missed an absolute corker which would have replaced one that I had put in my 12. And something very unusual happened during this research. A lot of lists, including those in quite popular magazines as well, I get the feeling that the, the writers just simply picked famous books and stacked them into a column maybe not even reading them themselves, because some of the books recommended for someone getting into the classics are, would, are seriously question whether you should recommend them to start with. For instance, Middlemarch by George Eliot was one of them. Now, Middlemarch is a wonderful book. You know, it's grand, it's got huge scope, but it is realist literature, and realist is not the easiest genre to get into. Um, and can be very stodgy and of course Middlemarch you know you're heading towards a thousand pages um, and I, I question the, the sagacity of that putting that book inside a list to get into the classics and so what I've done I've gone through books that I have read and that I know to be absolutely brilliant and enthralling and enchanting books obviously uh, there's a lot of subjectivity in saying what is a great book um, there may be some that you wouldn't get on with in this, but overall people are going to enjoy these books. So let's get into the 12 books that you may want to read next year, one book a month, or maybe if you're looking to encourage other friends to get into classics. The first book on our list of really good, exciting classics to read is by Daphne du Maurier, who wrote loads of great books, but this one is Rebecca. Now I would hold it up, except I don't have it. Doing this, I went to get all the books that I've read off my shelf and found I've loaned loads out and they haven't come back. Now, Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier is just a scintillating, wonderful story with romance and intrigue and suspense and quite a bit of the darkness going on as well. What's interesting about this book, the narrator, we don't know who the narrator is. We know, we know it's a, a young lady of some kind, but we don't get her name. And uh, that adds to the mystery. It actually allows you to be the character, to be the narrator, see everything through her eyes. We're not influenced by any uh, name or any description of her. Now, what happens? This narrator, I think it's in the south of France at the beginning, she's working as a maid to some rich woman, and she meets this English gentleman in his 40s who's a millionaire, and his name's um, Maxim de Winter. And they sort of get along and he charms her and she charms him and they, you know, they end up getting together. That's not a plot spoiler, by the way. That happens really quickly. And then she goes back with him as the new Lady de Winter to his grand hall of Mandalay on the Cornish coast in the southwest of England. 
And then the story starts getting a bit weird. And by weird, I don't mean crazy, like surreal. It begins to get a bit dark and tense and suspenseful. And it, give, it makes you start crawling at times. Because when she gets to Mandalay, there's a housekeeper called Mrs. Danvers. And um, <laughs> she is she is a great brooding presence, you know, sort of that malevolent spirit that seems to hover around. You can't quite make her out, though, but there's something sinister about her. And she respects and wants to keep alive the memory of the old Madame de Winter. And so there's a coolness between her and our narrator. And then there are funny goings on in the night and the, the spectre of Madame de Winter is in the background of everything, haunting our narrator, permeating the atmosphere everywhere. It includes um, her hold on Maxim de Winter. He, he, it, her memory disturbs him. And you follow a lot of his disturbing actions, his disturbed sleep, his disturbed mind. And there's this unknown, um, intransient wedge put between Maxim and our narrator. She's married him. And it's very cold and chilling and it's mysterious. And who was this woman before our narrator became Lady de Winter? You'll have to read the book to find out. Absolutely fascinating book, brilliant read. And once you've read it, you can easily go and watch the Netflix adaptation of the film, which is also very good, I might add. A second book that I recommend you read and is a really enjoyable read is one of Charles Dickens' novel. And I particularly wanted to pick a Dickens because if you or a friend you're trying to get interested in the classics starts reading, Dickens is a whole world of wonder. His problem, of course, being he writes some massive tomes. Loads of his books run to 800 pages. And I wouldn't recommend those to start with, particularly if you're a slower reader. But Great Expectations, this is going to be one of the biggest books in this list. It comes in at about 420 pages. And it's such a great read. Dickens has a unique style. His ability to caricature people and draw out all their idiosyncrasies. You know, you know these cartoonists, uh, obviously that's what caricature means, but those cartoonists, they can just pick out that feature of your face and accentuate it, which makes you look funny on paper and all your friends go, yes, yes, that's you, that's you. He does that with people in day-to-day -day life and you will look at them and go, yeah, I know that person, I know that kind of person. And he couldn't get away from caricaturing. I don't think he meant to do it. He was just that astute an observer that he couldn't help himself but pick out the foibles of people. Now, Great Expectations, it's not just a great book. It tells you a lot about London of its time. It's told through a first person narrator from childhood up to his man manhood. So it's what's called a Bildung's Roman, um, which is the story of someone's life. The Roman means sort of moving through. And his name's Philip Pirrett, but he's called Pip. Now, in the beginning, when he describes everything from a child's perspective, you will find it really funny. There are some brilliant characters in this, Miss Havisham being probably one of the best characters, Pip himself, and then you've got Joe Gargery. You just see how the young boy who's supposed to grow up and be a blacksmith's apprentice, somebody, a mysterious donor, gives money to him to help him become a gentleman. And so he moves from the, the countryside into London and finds his way in London. And what Dickens does through this is Dickens never just tells a story. He is always making an observation on society and on life. And you see Pip change as a character. Now, some people reading Great Expectations don't like this book for one reason. They fall out with Pip because Pip is brutally honest about his failings. But what it challenges you to do is not judge Pip, but to say you are Pip. And if you judge him badly, know that you're judging yourself negatively. Try and find the good in him because he is a good character. He's really good. But I recommend this book primarily because if you enjoy this, you will love Dickens across the board and you'll be introduced to a world like no other. Our third book up is To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. This book's uh, sold tens of millions of copies. 
It's phenomenal. It's set in the south of America during a period when racism obviously was running high. And it follows the story of, I was going to say Atticus Finch. Atticus Finch is the father of the narrator, who is called Scout. And she and her brother Jem live with their father. The, there's no mother there. And the father is a really fair-minded man. He's a lawyer and he's asked to represent a black man who's been accused of rape by a white girl. Now, I won't tell you where the white girl's from because that's actually quite an important part of the book. But what you follow, you see how Scout and Gem are taught by Atticus um, to be fair to all people. You will see the horrid prejudices and the small-mindedness of a close-knit community in America um, when segregation was around. And you also get a child's perspective because no child is born racist. We inherently know all people are equal, but they get to see how people around them judge and hold these prejudices. But it's also brilliantly contrasted with a bit of a spooky neighbour who lives next door to them who they very rarely see. In fact, they barely ever see this, this guy. And so he's like the bogeyman. And that makes a great contradistinction about what racism between adults is and the bogeyman is to children. I'm not going to say any more. It is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant book. And I highly recommend you read it. The fourth classic on our list, I can promise you, is an absolute zinger. It is Captain Blood by Raphael Sabatini. Now, when you hear the title Captain Blood, you may think this is very cliche. It sounds like your typical Errol Flynn movie, you know, going right back to the 30s, 40s. But this book, wow, it epitomises the, the piracy on the high wave genre. The protagonist is a man called Peter Blood. He's actually a physician. He's a very upstanding and fine gentleman who's got a bit of a, you know, a, a checkered past. I don't mean checkered morally, but just he's worked at various places. And we start with him in his flower bed, if I remember correctly, in not too far from the town of Monmouth. And it's during the Monmouth Rebellion. So this tells us we're in the year 1685. So we're talking sort of the golden age of piracy between the 1680 and 1715 is your golden age of piracy. And it starts off with a wrongful conviction for Peter Blood and he's shipped off to the West Indies to work on some plantation. Now, without giving much away, because there's loads that goes on that you've got to read to find out. I'm just going to jump about. As he's called Captain Blood, you know he's going to end up on a ship. And there he is on this Spanish galleon. He's now an outlaw. He's got his friends with him, his crewmates, Wolverstone and Hagthorpe and Ned Ogle is the gunner. And, you know, it's all daring do. But because he's a convict, naturally he's going to be pursued. And he's pursued by a governor, Governor Bishop. I think it's Bishop. It's been a while since I've read it. And Bishop you know, has this furious determination to get hold of Peter Blood. Interestingly, Blood himself um, sort of has a love thing for the governor's daughter. I mean, it's your classic cliche, isn't it? However, the way the story is executed is just great. You just want to keep turning. It's one of those books that you just think, I've got to get to the end of one chapter. And then when you get there, you just think, I'll just start the next chapter. And so you go. It's a book you'll read quite quickly. And it's just great. Fun. So there is our next classic, Raphael Sabatini's Captain Blood. Number five on our list of really enjoyable classics to get you into the classics is Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes. Now you can see this is a huge tome. Don't worry, this is not one book. This is the complete works. The one I want to point out, and I've recommended it again and again, I feel I should mention another one, but I'm sorry, this one, this particular work is so good is A Study in Scarlet. And the reason I'm flicking through is I want to show you just how big the book is. That there, just that much, I don't know if you can see that, is the story of Study in Scarlet. So it's a very quick read, but boy, oh boy, is it fascinating. This is the story in which you first meet Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. 
and you get to see the most incredible deductive mind ever invented. It doesn't matter what you watch today, whether it's The Mentalist or Bones or NCIS or whatever it may be, or Poirot, no one, no one comes close to Sherlock Holmes in just the sheer brilliance of his deduction. You might think it's all contrived until you read the books. For instance, there is a scene in Studying Scarlet where Sherlock has told Watson that he is a major or he's been in the army. Oh no, he says you're an army doctor and he's only just met him and he says you've been in Afghanistan. And Watson's like, oh, who told you that? And Sherlock said, I don't need anyone to tell me, I could work it out. And as a reader, you're thinking, okay, Conan Doyle's going to make a bit up here. It's just going to be a bit of willing suspension of disbelief until Sherlock explains how he knows this. Watson is so bamboozled and sceptical that he doubts it when Sherlock says, look, if you gave me one object from a person, I could tell you about the owner of that object. And so Watson hands him a, a pocket watch and he says, tell me about the owner, because it happens to be his brother. And Sherlock describes the character that owned this watch and Watson gets angry as if Sherlock's played a trick on him and has done background research. And you as a reader are thinking, how can he possibly know all this stuff? And then Doyle, the author, explains how Sherlock could know these things by observing intently. He says of Watson, he says, you see, but you don't observe or you see, but you don't notice. And he asks him, how many stairs up into this flat? And Watson's like, I don't know. He says, how many times have you gone up these stairs? Hundreds. He says, so you see the stairs, but you haven't observed that there are actually 12 of them. Now then, Sherlock is taken off to a case in which he walks into a room. Well, I won't tell you. You've got to watch it. Before he leaves the room, he's practically worked out what's happened and who's done it, or at least who they're looking for, the type of person. And the way Conan Doyle writes his books, his detective books, are a bit different. He writes the crime and solves it within about half to three quarters of the book. Then he goes back in time and shows you the crime being committed. It's a bit like how the old Miss Marples and Poirots used to work. You have the whole story, Poirot or Marple solves it, and then they gather everyone into a room to reveal the, the killer or the criminal, and on TV, it then plays back how the murder took place. That idea is taken from Conan Doyle's method of telling stories. And just one other thing. Um, it was in A Police for I, I know that um, Sherlock Holmes used to be compulsory reading if you worked in Scotland Yard. But I believe there's a police force internationally somewhere. Um, until 1950, anyone being a detective had to compulsorily read Sherlock Holmes because the deduction is that good. So there's the next book, Sherlock Holmes, A Study in Scarlet by Arthur Conan Doyle. Our sixth book on our list of 12 is a comedy. And when I say a comedy, this is a laugh out loud funny book. Yet it was written in the 19th century and it is, someone stolen it by the way, the little fiend, I wish I knew who had got my book off my shelf. It is Jerome K. Jerome's Three Men in a Boat. K in Jerome, by the way, is um, Klapka. That's his middle name. What a fantastic name, Jerome Klapka Jerome. Anyway, the story behind this hilarious short novella is that three men, George, Harris, and Jay, J stands for Jerome, so it's as if Jerome wrote it himself. They decide, as men of sort of reasonable means, that they want to take a two-week holiday up the Thames in a boat. It sounds idyllic, it sounds romantic and poetic, and they think, yes, that will be just the thing. It's summer, let us set forth and go up the boat, uh, up the river in a boat with their dog Montmorency, who is a bit of a scoundrel, to be quite honest. And it just recounts that story. And you think, how can that be funny? Well, it's the hijinks they get themselves into, but it's, I say hijinks, hijinks seems to suggest a somewhat contrived situation. And although it is to a degree, 
These are all ordinary things that you might do. For instance, going to Hampton Court maze and getting lost in it. Well, so many people have done that. But to hear it through the mouths of these three men who get so annoyed with one another, so <laughs> some, you know, are very angry at times. Then you've got them bragging about certain things like catching a fish that was this big kind of thing. It's just hilarious. And the little anecdotal stories that go along, for instance, when you're in a boat and you don't want to row, one of the things you can do is have a rope, a pulling rope, and two of the people will get onto the, the horse path next to the boat, uh, next to the river. The rope's tied to the boat and they will simply just pull it along while the one man left will steer. Um, and he just, Jay, the, the, the narrator, goes off talking about different people that have done this and stories he's heard. Um, you know, and how he talks about those who are pulling the boat, they often get too deep in conversation and forget they're pulling a boat. And how some people have become untied, but the two guys have carried on walking, just dragging a rope up the river. Or sometimes they've dragged the rope out of the river. And uh, he describes the boat hitting the bank as the sound of a thousand ripping sheets. <laughs> he talks about opening a tin, just a tin. I think it's a pineapple that has you in hysterics them trying to put up a tent in the rain. If you've ever camped, you know what that's like. And what's wonderful is you're reading it from 150 years ago. It's just so funny. And yet, Jerome K. Jerome had the ability to be so, so poetic. Um, he just had a great sense of humour. And some of the passages, you'll see him describe the scenery just brilliantly. And then he'll twist it right at the end and make you laugh at it. There's so much. Now, if you like this, you could go on to the sequel, which is Three Men on the Bommel, and that's where they ride bicycles through the Black Forest in Germany. It's not as funny, but even there, there are some absolute, absolute wonders of comic humour. But Three Men in a Boat, if you feel you want something light, but from the classics, read it. Please, please do yourself a favour and read it. So that was number six, Jerome K. Jerome's Three Men in a Boat. Number seven on the list is Baroness Orcs's The Scarlet Pimpernel. Now, wow, this is, a, again, this is a swashbuckling adventure set in the time of the French Revolution, so the 1790s. And, uh, wow, what a story. It's just full of intrigue and high adventure and tense moments and chases, everything. Basically, the story is this. The French Revolution is on and the Republic is killing off the aristocrats with the guillotine, as you well know from your history. Now, Robespierre is in power at this point. He's the, the, the head of the assembly. But the three characters this story revolves around are Chauvelin, who is a lawyer and an important person in the Republic who answers to Robespierre himself. And his job is to find aristocrats who are trying to escape France to England and he's to bring them to justice so that they can be guillotined. Across the water in England there is a secret agent and a group of others who are daring, they're, they're gentlemen, they're aristocrats, they are daring at going over to France to save aristocrats to help them escape. And the way they do it is like a spy. They do it in disguise. And I've got these elaborate plots for how they can find different aristocrats or their children and get them out from underneath the, the French uh, Revolution's noses. And when he, when these people perform one of these escape tricks, they leave their calling card, which is the Scarlet Pimpernel. And uh, that's, that's sort of their motif. Now, the Pimpernel himself, has a thing for a woman who is sympathetic to the cause, a French woman, Marguerite, who Chauvelin also likes. So what you've got is this love triangle in the middle of a revolution, surrounded by intrigue, plotting, spying, masks, you know, disguises, I'm not saying big moustaches and glasses. It's just great, great entertainment. And uh, if you enjoy this book, there is a brilliant rendition of it um, with Anthony Hopkins, I believe it is, 
playing the Pimpernel. And um, who's the fellow that plays Gandalf? Oh, dear me. I love that actor as well. Well, he plays Chauvelin. Brilliant, brilliantly done. And that's a film back in the 80s or 70s, maybe. But it's such a good rendition of this book. Anyway, that's the next book, The Scarlet Pimpernel. What list would be complete without a Jane Austen? And number eight on our list is by Jane Austen. But the thing about Jane Austen, if you're a man watching this, you might think, oh, I don't want to get into Jane Austen. It's all frills and lace and love and romance. Jane Austen is a magnificent writer. Pride and Prejudice, absolute sparkling wit. Emma is a work of genius. Mansfield Park is just, mag it's a masterpiece. All of them I could say something about. But the one I'm going to recommend, if you want to get into the classics, is one that is probably ranked last out of all of them in, in most people's list, and it's Northanger Abbey. Northanger Abbey, I picked this for a particular reason. It's short, and it's highly entertaining. And it shows off the period that Austen is describing, but more than that, it shows off very well what Austen is able to do. Like Dickens, who would come after her, she has an extraordinary power of perception. She sees through the layers of society to all of its warts and all, you know, all of its blemishes, all of the ridiculous things that make up the society, the pomp and the ceremony and the, the faux sentiment and morality and moralizing and virtue signaling as we call it today. She sees through all of that, but what she does in Northanger Abbey, because all of her books take on some element that she sees in life. And by the way, any Austenites out there, I promise you I am going to do a Jane Austen video, so look out for that. Um, with Northanger Abbey, what she actually does is she becomes an author who is criticising the books that are being read by young ladies of her day. And that is so wonderful because this sort of takes a bit of a shot at the gothic genre, which, although relatively new in Jane Austen's time, had already developed a load of cliches. And Austen takes that on, but she also takes on the high society and the silly games that people play uh, centred in the town of Bath um, for the first part of the book, which was, you know, where high society went. It was part of the Grand Tour. And uh, you'll get through this in no time. She has a very light touch in her explanations, uh, not her explanations, in her writing, in her narrative. So she's very pleasant to read. And Northanger Abbey is a highly undervalued book and a brilliant place to start with the classics, especially if you want to dip your toe in Jane Austen. Going into book nine, you might remember that I mentioned at the beginning that some people, when they write a list of classics to start with, to get people interested that are really enjoyable to read, they mentioned George Eliot's Middlemarch. And I said George Eliot being a realist, it's not always the easiest to get into. So it might surprise you that my ninth pick is a George Eliot, and it is Silas Marner. Again, a bit like Dickens, Eliot tended to write rather large books. You know, if you, if you wanted to murder someone and weigh their body down in a lake, just go out and buy Daniel Deronda and Middlemarch and maybe Mill on the Floss just for some extra ballast. Um, but Silas Marner, what is it? 260 pages long. And it's actually a really enjoyable book. Um, you have this guy, Silas Marner, who starts off as a very upright religious lad who is wronged. He's wrongfully accused by a close friend and he ends up sort of turning himself into a hermit. He leaves the industrial towns where the evangelicals are and goes to the small made up village of Ravelo, where he just weaves. He's a weaver and he accumulates money. And he's a very curious character because he sort of has catatonic episodes where he just freezes and doesn't move. And the villagers are not sure of him. But then there's a counter character like him who is in, you know, the grand manor of the village. And their lives are oddly a reflection of one another. They are similar and polar opposite at the same time. And there's a bad guy that is sort of 
interested in Silas Miner's money that he's accumulating. Now, something happens which really hurts Miner, and then something else happens which brings him extraordinary comfort. And it's a realist novel. And that's the great thing about it. It just details a lot of the everyday things that people are doing, but it's wound around a very interesting tale. And that's what makes this so readable. So if you want to get into later 19th century classics in the realist period, if you want to read a George Eliot to start with, go for Silas Marner. It is a pleasant tale, and by the end of it, it will just leave you touched, just graced with a gentle hand. It's nothing profound, but it's very satisfying. So that's the ninth one, Silas Marner by George Eliot. The tenth book on our list of twelves is another book which I happen to have loaned out so I can't show you. I'll have to put a picture here. And that is Wilkie Collins' Woman in White. Oh my days. I, I challenge anyone to read this book and not enjoy it. What I will say about this one book though is unlike the others that I have picked, this one is pretty big. However, it is such a gripping tale. So well told. Wilkie Collins, by the way, in the 19th century, one of the best authors of the Victorian age. Like, him and Dickens were best mates. That says a lot. Um, and they used to look at each other's work and help edit each other's work and give advice on each other's work. So Wilkie Collins knew what he was about. And he is probably the best writer of early detective fiction. Um, it's what you would class sensational novels. People read it for the thrill. But it's, it's gothic as well. It's got all the elements of gothic. And Wilkie Collins, he just knew what the public wanted. And why he's a classic, although there's no deeper meaning necessarily to this work, it's a classic because it is the example of a book perfectly executed. You know, if you could write like that today, you would have a bestseller on your hands. So, The Woman in White. It starts with our first narrator, Walter Hartwright, wandering through London at night when he comes across this woman who's in great distress and she's all in white. So he helps her um, to find her way somewhere, gets her a carriage and sends her off. Then the police come and say, have you seen a woman all in white? And he says, as a matter of fact, I have. I've just stuck her in a carriage and shooed her off. And they say she's escaped from a mental asylum. So, you know, a bit dun dun dun. Um, mental asylums, typically gothic, very sensational. And especially when you consider the day that this was written. But unfortunately, they can't find her. Then Walter, the story, that's just the opening. Then he goes off and he's working as a tutor. That's his job. And he goes to this large house up north. Um, Fairly, I think it is. So Fairly. And he wants to teach the two students there. And there's a, a Laura Fairley and her half-sister. And Walter, he's talking to these girls and he can't help but notice a resemblance between Laura, this student, and the woman in white. And it turns out that Laura had a sister who everyone called Anne Catherick, who was a mentally disturbed child who dressed in white because that's what her mother first dressed her in. And the story goes from there. But all is not as it seems. And you get introduced to the villains. Sir Glyde. Glyde with a Y. It looks menacing on the paper and Glyde gives you that oily, you know, makes you wonder whether Collins got the idea for his names from Dickens, who was the master at characterful names. And then I think you've got Count Fosco. Again, a great name. It sort of stands out from the page. And in this, you've got darkness. You've got the, the disturbed evil spirit, you know, the blackened heart. Um, you've got barbarous conniving and scheming. You've got the threat of being tangled in Ariadne's web. All of this. Um, it's just brilliant. You will, possibly, a lot of you, will stay up reading this to the early hours in the morning because it's just wonderfully terrifying. And when I say terrifying, it's not horror. It just gets you. You know, it thrills and it builds page after page after page. And you just have to know how it goes. On this list, I would say this may be 
mm, with the exception of the Great Expectations, maybe the greatest book on this list. Um, but depending on the genre you like, if you know what I mean. But it is a big one. And I, I've promised only to put one big one in this list. However, there is an extra book I am going to pick at the end, which is also a large book for those who want to take on a brilliant classic, but are prepared to invest time into a lot of pages. So anyway, that was number 10, and that was Wilkie Collins' Woman in White. Number 11, and by the way, the ranking of these isn't in importance of the books or in quality of the books. It's just randomly assigned these books are, uh, in order that is. I've thought a lot about which books to put in the video. Number 11 is P.G. Woodhouse. Now, the book I've got here is Jeeves in the Offing. So you've probably heard of Jeeves and Worcester. Um, the buffoon young gentleman with his exceptionally bright and intelligent butler who helps him get out of all sorts of troubles. Actually, that's a, that's a, a trope taken from ancient Greece when comedies were basically people of responsibility being, you know, stupid and being bailed out by a slave, a clever slave. So he takes that, but I'm not saying you have to read Jeeves in the Offing. I would suggest you pick up, at some point in your life, any book by P.G. Woodhouse, specifically if it is a Jeeves and Worcester, one of the Blandings set, uh, Blandings Castle, so there's, there's themes like Summer Lightning and Heavy Weather and Something Fresh, um, or any of the books which involve Smith, and it's Smith with a P. The reason I bring these up P.G. Woodhouse was the first book I ever read that made me guffaw with laughter out loud in front of the public. I was on top of a bus at the time. By on top, I mean on the top floor of a double-decker. I wasn't actually outside on top of the bus. Um, because his writing is second to none. He is a comic genius. He is the comics comic no one turns a phrase like P.G. Woodhouse, with maybe one exception, and that's Jerome K. Jerome, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but Jerome only, he didn't write as many books as Woodhouse. Let me just read you the opening paragraphs of this book to give you his style. And I'll just give you a heads up. When narrating out loud, you can never make Worcester sound like he does in your head. And Worcester tells everything in the first person. But this is the opening sentence. Uh, paragraph, just so you can get Woodhouse's vibe. Jeeves placed the sizzling eggs and bee on the breakfast table, and Reginald Kipper Herring and I, licking the lips, squared our elbows and got down to it. A lifelong buddy of mine, this Herring, linked to me by what are called imperishable memories. Years ago, when striplings, he and I had done a stretch together at Malvern House, Bramley-on-Sea, the preparatory school conducting by that Prince of Stinkers, Aubrey Upjohn, M.A., and had frequently stood side by side in the Upjohn study awaiting the receipt of six of the juiciest from a cane of the type that biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder, as the fellow said. So we were, you might say, rather like a couple of old sweats who had fought shoulder to shoulder on Crispin's Day, if I've got the name right. <laughs> it's just the classic English buffoon. Read a Woodhouse. If it's not your cup of tea, that's fine. But for the majority of people, once you've read a Woodhouse, you will become a raving fan instantly. And the great thing is, he wrote nearly 100 books. But start with either Jeeves and Worcester, something from the Blanding set, or Smith. So there's number 11, pretty much anything by P.G. Woodhouse. The twelfth book on this list of classics I think you will thoroughly enjoy and uh, the best route into classic literature, especially if you want to do the book a year, a book a month challenge next year, is a quiet book. It's a novella and it's so serene, so beautiful. There's not many books that are its equal. And that book is A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr written in 1980 or 81, I think, so a modern classic. This book has also been snaffled wickedly from my, my collection. Someone's got it somewhere. Um, this book, like I say, is just quiet. It leaves, when you finish the book, it leaves just a fingerprint on you or 
just the the perfumed exhalation of a beautiful person who's passed you, you know, or whispered in your ear. You know when you when you're young and you like someone and you don't know if they like you, but then they just give you a hug goodbye and you get that person to person contact and they go off and you are sat with this sort of faint fuzz, a beautiful aura around you. Yet nothing major has happened. That's the feeling this book leaves you with. Nothing really happens. It just follows a chap who has come back from the First World War. He's actually got shell shock um, and has post-traumatic stress disorder. And he's a bit of a, an artist, a, a restorer. And he's been asked to go to this little tiny village to peel back the plaster work on a church. And it's a small church to reveal a medieval fresco underneath. He sets up the scaffolding and he begins to go to work. He's very quiet and at peace and he sleeps in the bell tower. And he meets some of the villagers as they come into the church and talk to him. And he's invited to certain dinners. And, but nothing much happens. He just gets very interested in the fresco itself. And he begins to emotionally connect to the painter from 700 years before him. No, 600 years before him. Just outside of the church, beyond the graveyard limits, the wall, is another chap who used to be in the army, and he's an archaeologist, and he's been called in to dig up the grave, find the grave of one of the old ancestors of the village that's linked to one of the richer families. And he lives in this tent where he's digging in the ground. Um, I think his surname is Moon. And he discovers that there was Roman settlements in this area. and He's fascinated by it. And he, strangely enough, has a connection to the person he's looking for. You don't notice this straight away. It's not out and out rightly said, but this is, this is where, at the end of the book, you just have this poof moment, this lovely, like I say, this perfumed breath that just brushes your soul. And the two of them sort of have a respect for each other. They're different characters. There's this hearkening of the people from the past, but all of it takes place in one month, a month in the country. And the way it ends is just exquisite. It's just perfect the way it ends. And the reason I put it in this list, it's not Rip Roaring, it's not Captain Blood, it's not the Scarlet Pimpernel, it's not a detective like Sherlock or, or the Woman in White. It's not a great Bildung's romance like, you know, Great Expectation. But what a book. If you want to see how the classics can affect you in just a quiet style, get this book and read it. I recommend every one of you read A Month in the Country. Wrapping up our list of 12 classics that you will thoroughly enjoy and will get you or a friend into classic reading is a sci-fi one for all you sci-fi lovers out there. The brilliant Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. This was written in the 30s and is just, you know, there's plenty of dystopian novels and sci-fi novels, but some, some are so prophetic, so accurate in observing where the trail of society is headed. This is one of the things that makes classics classic, like truly great. They perceive underneath society and can even see where its logical conclusion goes. And A Brave New World is like that. So what you have, um, it's set in London, but in the year, I can't remember the exact year, but it's AF. Instead of AD, it's AF. It means after Ford, um, because that's the technological revolution, the starting point, the gasoline engine. Um, I think it's the year 600. So it puts us, in our terms, 2,500. Um, and society is technocratic. It's got a strict hierarchy, a caste system. And everyone is born sort of like they're, they're made in, in synthetic wombs kind of thing. They're engineered. You don't have children born the usual way. And you're all assigned your class based on your labour ethic or your intelligence. Now, the book will bring up a couple of people, but some of them. You've got Lenina. She's a labourer, but she's voluptuous, sexually attractive. Um, and you see how her role plays in society. But then you've got um, Bernard Marx, Bernard Marx. He is a psychologist. And the interesting thing about him is 
Although he's high in the caste system because of his intelligence, he's shorter than he should be. And so he's already got a bit of a chip on his shoulder. He doesn't fit in. And he works on sort of sleep therapy. And through his learning, he starts to question the way that the people are controlled. You see, in London, in the system in, in, 2000, in 600 AF, uh, the Brave New World, people are sort of kept obedient and placid by this happy drug called Soma. Um, Soma sort of referring to sleep or latent, you know, just laid back. And Bernard doesn't like this and he begins to speak out against it. Now, people, other professors, don't like him questioning the authority of the day, the narrative of the day. And so there's talk of exiling him. Um, but you'll have to read the book to see exactly what happens. Just the one of the character that's very interesting in this book is Helmholtz. Helmholtz Watson, his name is. And he is a writer, but he really struggles to write, to be creative, because everyone is kept placid. And what is all writing based on? Struggle. The inner experience of human beings is a struggle to overcome something. But in a world where everyone is under the influence of Soma, that's hard to make a creative expression as a writer. Now, I'm not going to say any more. I hope that's whetted your appetite. If you're a sci-fi fan and you want to see sci-fi written really, really well um, and very, very thoughtful, it, will, it really provokes thinking then read this last recommended book, which is Aldous Huxley's A Brave New World. Now, I did say there was going to be one bonus book, but I kept it off the original 12 because of its size. However, it is an absolute tour de force in writing, in storytelling. It's got everything in this book, and it is The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Alexander Dumas, at his peak, could you find someone to compete with him? I mean, he is just something else. I think he's called the, the lion of French literature. The Count of Monte Cristo follows Edmond Dantes, who on his wedding day is arrested for a crime that not only did he not commit, he's not even told what the crime is. And he's taken to the, to the um, feared Chateau d'If, which is um, a prison castle on an island in the bay. You know, it's, it's got that reputation of like the Bastille. It's terrifying to go there. While he's there, he meets an elderly chap who teaches him so much about mathematics, about literature, philosophy. He also tells him about where to find treasure uh, called Sparda's Gold. It was uh, a, a mass of riches accumulated by a cardinal Sparda. He escapes. By the way, the whole section of him in prison is just amazing. It's wonderful. Um, you, you think, how can it be that exciting in prison when you're locked up? It's just brilliant what happens there. Then he escapes and you get the vast majority of the book then of his return as the Count of Monte Cristo. And all the people that were tied to him in his past life, what attitude will he show to all of them, including the woman he was going to marry, Mercedes? You'll have to read it to find out. Now, I will warn you of one thing. This will grip you. You will read and read and read. And then at about the, and here's, here's very specific for you, about the three-fifths mark, <laughs> there is a section that goes pretty dry. My wife didn't mind it. I did. Um, but when you're considering how big this book is, which is like 900 pages long, and not even in the biggest font either, there's so many characters, you obviously have to have at a point the, the tying together of things. And that's what happens partway through to prepare what would become the sort of the, the, the zenith of the book to really come to that grand climax. It's just an outstanding work of art. I mean, really, if you are building a classic library, ooh, what an idea for, for a video. Would you like that? Building your own classic library, books you should have. Um, let me know in the comments. If you're building a library, this is one book you should have on the shelf. And ideally, you should have read it. It looks impressive to have there, 
But I guarantee if you've got a book this size, someone's going to say, have you read that? You, you really want to be able to say, yes, I have. So, <laughs> but it's worth reading and you will enjoy it, honestly. Don't set yourself the target of reading that in a month. Just read it while you're reading other books, just a bit at a time, and you will get through it in one year um, and you'll still enjoy it. So there you go. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed this video of 12 classic books that are brilliant to read and are a great introduction into the classics, especially if that's what you're hoping to do in the next year, a book a month, like Jay, who gave me this idea. Um, tell me which one of these you've read, which ones, please, if you are watching this and you want to help my channel, leave a comment, okay? Like it, leave a comment. Tell me which one grabs your attention the most. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts. I'd love to know out there what people are thinking grabs the attention the most. So until the next time, I wish you joy in whatever you decide to read.